everybody, Kestava back with another video for you, and today we're going to be talking about welds and welding of steel. Um, we're just going to do, um, I wouldn't say the easiest example in the world, I'd call it medium. Yeah, 5 out of 10, medium, um, in terms of difficulty and kind of the different um, kind of forces that can be acting through a weld. Um, but they can become a lot more complex than this example, and they can be a lot easier than this example. So this should hopefully give you a taste um, of a couple different aspects on how to tackle um, sizing your welds um, when you're calling out uh, welds to connect steel elements. So today we're going to jump right in. Um, the question that I have come up with are, um, are the quarter inch welds structurally adequate to support the load? So this is the diagram I made, kind of three dimensional, um, isometric. And what we have here is a scenario of a cantilevered um, W section, uh, W8 by 10, as you can see denoted down here, with a force acting on the end of the cantilever. And then the W section is a three foot long cantilever that is welded to some steel element vertical column um, in the background. Um, that part's not important, but I've highlighted um, the three welding points. So a weld along the top flange, a weld along the bottom flange, and then a weld um, along the web. So those three welds um, are going to be supporting this steel member with this load at the end of it. Um, that load I've defined as four kips, or as we know, 4,000 pounds. Um, and first off, what we can determine is what kind of forces are acting on the welds. Well, we know that there's a bending moment, um, which is just P times uh, your eccentricity. Uh, you know, uh, force times moment arm is your is what a moment is. Force times distance. So we have the force PU of four kips right here. The moment arm of three feet. That's the length of the beam. Multiply those together, that gives you 12 kip feet. That's at the end of the beam. So that's directly in this weld is where all that moment is being experienced um, or concentrated. Uh, and then the other thing we have is a shear force. So we have that PU value um, and we have a counteracting shear. Um, I guess we can call it... Um, VVN, um, VVN, or just VN. So a shear that needs to counteract that that PU for to balance out statics, um, and that VU is just equal to PU. So four kips at the end. Um, again, four kips being experienced at the end of the beam to at the weld. <clears throat> what we're going to be using today is our uh, AISC steel construction manual as well as, I got another trick up my sleeve for you guys. I'll bring this over. Um, so this is Design of Welded Structures. Um, this is the Lincoln, the James F. Lincoln Arc Welding Foundation. Um, believe it or not, this book, it's a little um, old, but actually not too bad. Um, they still sell these. Uh, and what's really nice is this really nice big book you can see here. It's got a lot. It's all about welded structures. So it goes really in depth of everything. Really nice examples in here, step by steps, um, all the charts, anything you'd want to know about welding. And hardcover, like cloth finished book. And you can get this book, believe it or not, from these people for like 20 bucks with free shipping. So, and it comes with another book as well um, that's also 20 bucks, but you can just get this one. Um, Highly recommend getting this super underrated book, and it's super cheap, so get that. Um, again, design of welded structures. So just type that into Google. You'll be able to find it. Blue cover. It's big. Um, but yeah, those are the two that we will be using today. And that's what I, I use both those regularly um, when I'm uh, designing welds. So that being said, first thing we have to do after we have our forces collected is we need to turn the welds into line loads. And the way that you can think about this is um, it's basically, it simplifies what's happening and how to calculate um, the force in a weld. Is basically you have um, stresses breaking down into um, shear flow 
through your welds and you need to calculate the demand of shear flow on the weld versus the capacity of the weld itself. Um, and the way that we can do this simply is breaking down those stresses um, into line loads. So um, a force per distance. Um, and the way that we do this depends on what forces are acting on your um, weld. So what I will do is bring this up. I'm gonna go into my book here and actually have it tabbed um, to welding chart. And so you can find what I'm about to show you um, online, but basically determine force on a weld. Um, so I've even started when I was studying. So determine all forces acting on your weld connections. That's what you wanna do first. And you have little visual examples and every type of force uh, loading that's acting on a weld. So you have tension and compression, you have vertical shear. So we have that one. Um, you have bending. It even shows the example basically that I have for us today. So you have bending. Um, we have that one as well. You have twisting. We don't have any twisting today. And then uh, you have secondary welds. Um, so this is like elements um, welded together type of thing. So we'll don't worry about this right now. So just this area here. So we have vertical shear and we have bending. So that means if you did standard design formula and kept it as a stress, for shear, you know the stress, shear stress is shear over area. And for bending, you know your um, bending stress is your moment over your section modulus. Um, or if you treat, see, if you treat the weld as a line, then it comes into um, force per inch um, or a line load. And that can just be simplified as um, force equals V over AW, which is uh, area of weld in the form of a line. And then so that's for shear. And then for bending, you have force equals moment over SW. Where do we find AW and where do we find SW? So, and I'll come back to our sheet just to reiterate that. So we have bending, we have shear, M over SW. Shear is V over AW. That will give us F sub B for bending and F sub V um, for shear. Again, for it's a line load. In this, in this case, we're gonna solve for kip per inch and kip per inch is our units. We'll do shear first. Here, I'll get my freaking finger out of the way. Um, we'll do shear first. So we go to AW, um, and that was defined earlier. We need to define this. And that is the area of weld treated, uh, and then we're going to treat the width of the weld as just a constant of one. Um, so literally, it's just AW just becomes the total length of the weld. Um, and so we know AW transforms into L, which we know if we look at our cross section here, which is a cut through the beam, looking at our weld this way, our W section connecting to our member beyond. Um, we have this weld here, and we have the weld in the top flange and the weld in the bottom flange. So that's quarter inch fillet weld, quarter inch fillet weld, that's six inches long, and a quarter inch fillet weld at the bottom. Um, and so for shear, we need to remember, this is a little trick um, that I won't get into today, but shear can only be transferred through a member, uh, through a W section, through its web. So the only welds that are um, transferring shear and resisting that shear force is the weld on the web. So that one is the only length that we can take into consideration. So it's called as, as a six inch weld. So that length is six inches. So that's our AW. And now we need to find, for bending, we need to find SW. Well, SW is, if we go back to our blue um, welding book, we have another table. And that's um, properties of weld treated as a line. And what you have here is you have bending and twisting. And we have some equations. Twisting, we don't have. Bending, we have. And then what you have here is what the weld geometry looks like. And so we need to determine that. And for bending, again, since shear can only be transferred through the web, similarly, moment can only be transferred through the flanges of a W section. So we're looking at 
that top weld and that bottom weld to transfer the bending moment. So our geometry looks like this. We have a weld in the bottom flange and a weld in the top flange bending about our x-axis. So if you don't follow, bending about axis. That being the x-axis because we're our beam is bending about that x-axis. So if you look up the 3D, it's going to be wanting to bend over itself like that and deflect downward. Um, so we have this type of geometry. So if we go back to SW in our table, we go until, boom, there's the type of geometry we have. And SW is given as an equation, is B times D. They define B as the width, that width there, and D as the distance between the two welds. So B is going to be 4 inches, and D is going to be 8 inches. Here we go. B, D. So SW equals BD equals... Um, uh, oh, I reverse these, but it's the same thing. So B is actually 4 inches, and D is actually 8 inches. Still multiplied together, that gets you 32 inches squared. And again, only welds on flanges can transfer a moment. So we have our SW now. Go on. Now we have all of our unknowns, and we can solve. So M was our MU, and we need to convert that to, to kip inch, so 12 kip feet times 12 to get it into kip inches, divided by SW of 32 inches squared gets us 4.5 kips per inch. And that's the force being experienced, that's the demand on each inch of the weld. And then the shear is uh, your VU, so four kips over AW, which is the length of your weld on your web, which we determined as six inches, equals 0 0.67 kips of demand per inch of your weld. Now we need to find, the, so we have our demands. So this is the, man, the, the demands on the welds. Now we need to find the capacity of the welds. So this is what we have in all three scenarios. So this means you have a quarter inch, it's a fillet weld, and this actually, this little flag, means that it's welded in the field. So the, that beam is going to be positioned in place in the field, and it's going to be welded there, as opposed to if this wasn't here, that means it would be welded in, in like a shop or a facility, and it would arrive on site already welded in place. So... Just a little background for you guys. We'll go over another video um, later going into all sorts of welding types and callouts and how to determine what a weld is. Um, yeah, um, I'm planning to do that, but if you want me to expedite that, just leave me a comment below so uh, I can get that one going for you. We're going to use LRFD because um, I designated, basically I called out ultimate forces um, at the very beginning. So if we went back to the beginning, I called out PU um, as the force that was acting. So I, I assumed that we were going to do this in LRFD. So that's the only reason why. But just confirm what you're using. You can either use ASD or LRFD. You just want to be consistent throughout and use the correct factors. We, we all know that. Um, so yeah, so now we're actually going to close up our blue book. We're going to go to the steel manual. And we're going to open up the welds chapter, which is part eight. Um, it's got your little weld tab here. And actually, we're going to flip through part of my shakiness. And I'd like you to go to 8-8. Eight -eight. Um, and what you'll see here is available strength for a weld, which is defined as Rn. And it's presented as this equation here. And you can solve it, again, for either LRFD, use phi, or ASD, you use omega. Um, L is defined as the length of your weld, and D is uh, defined as the weld size in sixteenths of an inch. So D over 16. Um, and then uh, FEXX, that is actually your weld electrode strength. You can read about it. Um, a little bit in this chapter, but I won't get into it. It's very, very common. It's very typical that they're using a, a weld electrode strength of 70 KSI 
if you're talking about some high strength materials, um, then are metals or really special metals, um, then this might change. Um, but for most construction practices, this is a constant at 70 KSI. And what this can actually do, that's where it focuses, is it means this weird little equation here can actually break down into these this chart here. So we're going to use LRFD. And it just breaks down simply into phi Rn equals this constant times D times L. So if we switch back over, we talked about that, 70 KSI. Um, unless it's spec otherwise, specified otherwise, um, will be 70 KSI. D is that 16th of an inch, so we call it a quarter inch weld. So if you change a quarter inch into sixteenths of an inch, a quarter inch equals four sixteenths of an inch. So hence D equals four. And then we have everything. So I've plugged it in here as the long equation. Um, so phi of 0 0.75, 0 0.6 is a, um, just a constant. 70 KSI for the electrode strength. Root two over two, um, again, is another constant. 4 sixteenths, 4 being the D. And then you always want to break it down and analyze this, the capacity per inch of weld, not the total. Um, it's a lot easier to compare um, multiple welds and demands. So keep the L in that equation as 1. And when that comes out, it comes out to 5.57 kips per inch, which then we can easily just compare to both... Um, our, our demands. Um, so our demand for bending, which is 4.5 kip per inch, and our shear, which is 0 0.67 kip per inch. Both of those, since both weld types are both quarter inch, um, they are both less than the capacity of the weld um, of 5.57 kip inch. So we are okay. So go back to the beginning. Um, the quarter inch welds are structurally adequate. We're good. So this works out. All of this over here works out. Um, and there we go. That's all we have. Uh, so again, this is a little in-depth, but it's not the most in-depth about welding. There's some other nuances as you get a little more complex with twisting um, or some other forces involved. But for today, I think it was a good start. And I think it gets you some confidence to start uh, sizing some welds and calling them out uh, in your designs and connections. So if you have any questions, as always, leave them in the comments below. Um, and yeah, if you are liking the content on my channel, please um, feel free to leave a tip if you're using the Brave network, um, the Brave browser network. I'd always appreciate that. Um, but nevertheless, I'm always going to be continuing to provide content um, any chance that I can. So uh, until next time, see you guys later. Bye.